Let's take an in-depth look at the phase diagram for a particularly important substance, namely water. So water exhibits properties that are quite remarkable as a chemical substance. And some of those properties are really quite critical, frankly, for life on, on this planet. So this phase diagram does not look particularly remarkable yet, per se. Uh, it seems to resemble one we looked at for benzene in the past video. So we still have log of the pressure on the, on the ordinate and a temperature on the abscissa. There's a triple point, solid liquid gas. And so we know a lot of things about water just from our uh, experience. Namely, the melting point is 273 Kelvin at one atmosphere. So there's a log scale. So one atmosphere would be zero. Log of, log of one is zero. So if I run over here at one atmosphere, I'll run into the solid liquid, the melting point at, sure enough, about 273 Kelvin. And if I keep going until I get to the liquid gas transition, which is right about here, and look down, sure enough, that's about 373 Kelvin. So that's the boiling point. And then there's a triple point, which is at a very low vapor pressure, you see. It's uh, less than a tenth of an atmosphere, almost about a hundredth of an atmosphere of vapor pressure, and a temperature not too different, it looks like, from the, uh, the actual atmospheric melting point. But it's worthwhile to uh, zoom in a little bit more closely. And when one does that and focuses on this solid liquid coexistence curve, what one discovers is that as the pressure is increased, the melting temperature actually decreases. That is, the slope of this line is negative. It's very, very slightly displaced from vertical, so it's rather hard to see in this diagram, but it does indeed displace so that as you increase pressure, melting point drops. And so that is, for the case of the, the pressures that are shown here, and at those pressures, the solid form of water is what's called ice one, all right? And so I've, I've emphasized that by putting a Roman numeral one here. In this font, that looks a little bit like an L might, but this is not ice liquid. That would be a rather unusual way to designate ice. But instead, it is the, the first, the most important solid phase of water, ice one. So at constant temperature then, if you increase the pressure, you will melt ice into water. And that's, that's very unusual. So here again, the, the negative slope. And now just expressed a little bit more uh, directly, what is the temperature of fusion, that is the melting point, of water as a function of pressure covering a much larger pressure range in this case? And so what you see is that down near one atmosphere, we've got our usual 273 Kelvin. But if I ramp up the pressure more and more, 1,000 atmospheres, 2,000 atmospheres, I drive that melting point down to a little below 260 Kelvin. So the slope of the curve near a pressure of one atmosphere is not terribly large, minus 7.7 .7 times 10 to the minus 3 degrees Celsius per atmosphere, but it is negative. So that offers us an interesting opportunity for a self-assessment, and it's, it's one that I've chosen based on a certain urban myth that maybe some of you have heard, uh, being Minnesotans, for example. And that is that when you go ice skating, the reason skates work efficiently is that the pressure of your body on the skates melts the ice into liquid water, and you skate on a thin layer of water as a result. So I, I don't know how many of you have heard that, but uh, probably some of you have. So here's an opportunity to test out that uh, assertion. And now, uh, hopefully, you have come to the point of recognizing that the urban legend with respect to ice melting under the pressure of a skater is just that. It is a legend. Uh, the amount of pressure that you, a normal human being, would exert on your ice skate blades is much too small to change the melting point of water by anything significant. So I'll let you spend some time reading this explanation, and then we'll move on. Now let's address from a more thermodynamic perspective, why does ice melt under pressure? So in order to answer that question, let's remember that the partial derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to pressure at constant temperature is the volume. 
And so if we think then about melting being a spontaneous process, so we're taking something from a solid to a liquid, being spontaneous, it'll have a negative delta G value, and we're increasing the pressure, that's what we're interested in, so a negative delta G divided by a positive delta P, if you like, must, in that case, imply a delta V that is negative. A negative number divided by a positive number is a negative number. That is, the volume is decreasing as I go from the solid to the liquid phase. So the liquid has a smaller volume than the solid. And given a smaller volume, but the same mass, it's the same amount of substance, that must mean that liquid water is denser than ice. We've put the same mass into a smaller volume. And so that's what makes water very unusual. For most substances, that is not true. The solid is more dense than the liquid. But this, of course, is responsible for why ice floats on water. Ice 1 floats. If ice 1 did not float, if it behaved like so many other substances where the solid is more dense than the liquid, then as water froze, the solid water would sink to the bottom of whatever lake, river, ocean, for instance, it was sitting in, and we would fill up all those lakes, rivers, oceans from the bottom with solid water until ultimately it would freeze to the top if the temperature is sufficiently cold. And that would be very bad for fish. So in, an, in essence, the, uh, the reason that there's life on the planet to some extent that originated in the water is that you do not freeze from the bottom. Instead, you freeze over the top. That allows a liquid layer underneath where life can persist. And typically, it's not cold enough to drive that freezing all the way down to the bottom of lakes, not if they're sufficiently deep. So a very unique property of water. Now, it may be somewhat surprising. You might say, why, why is it that for water as a substance, the liquid is denser than the solid? I, you'd think when you press on anything hard enough, you make a solid, right? And actually, the answer to that question is, sure, you press on anything hard enough, and you make a solid. The center of stars, the center of huge planets have solids of amazing things like uh, hydrogen, nitrogen, you name it. However, uh, we're talking about a relatively narrow temperature and pressure range when we talk about ice one and its liquid. If we were to go beyond the pressure we're talking about here. So in particular, I've got the phase diagram for water. It's on a log scale. And so this particular phase diagram goes up to about 1,000 atmospheres. The anti-log of 3 is 1,000. I'll now translate that over here to a different phase diagram where the pressure units are in kilobar. So this is 1,000 bar. So this 10 to the third is 1 kilobar. This is the phase diagram for water now extended over this much larger pressure range. And what you see, all these different Roman numerals label different solid phases of water. So ice one is down here at low pressure and moderately low temperatures below zero Celsius. But as I increase the pressure at these temperatures, I begin to pass through different phases. So if you like the crystal of the ice of the solid water changes, the crystal form changes, and it changes so as to reduce the density. More pressure, it wants to reduce the density. That's why it's a spontaneous change, right? We again are seeing a delta G that's negative for a delta P that's positive, so the volume must be going down. So there are different ways to pack those water molecules that become more favorable at higher and higher pressures. And so there's the interesting phenomenon that if we look over here at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, which nominally for us means boiling water, under sufficient pressure, you can have ice seven at the temperature of water boils at atmospheric pressure. So again, an opportunity to do a quick self-assessment, and that is to order the densities of some ices at a particular temperature. So I'll let you spend some time with that. And here's the explanation with a helpful brown arrow. I'll let you take a little bit of time to look that over. And that's it for water, a terrifically important substance, and it was fun to get to know it a little bit better. In the next video, we're going to look at supercritical behavior.